Um, so welcome to our seminar on um, in uh, interreligious relations. Uh, our speaker today, it's a real joy to me that we're able to make the best of a bad situation, uh, the very best in fact, and have uh, a transatlantic uh, speaker with us. Um, our speaker is uh, Dr. Aaron Rosen, uh, Professor of Religion and Visual Culture uh, and Director of the Henry Luce III Centre um, for uh, Religion and uh, the Arts at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, uh, DC. Um, Aaron and I go back, getting on for 20 years now, I guess. Oh, um, good Lord. I know. <laughs> so uh, it's, um, it's a particular personal uh, pleasure for me as well uh, to, be, to be hosting uh, Aaron's talk uh, today. Um, you've all seen um, Aaron's uh, illustrious biography uh, has gone around with the invitation to the talk. I shan't rehearse it uh, uh, all for you, but just a note that he... Uh, is the author of, well, let's say several books, but I would actually say many books uh, is now probably more appropriate. Um, Imagining Jewish Art uh, from 2009, uh, from his doctoral thesis, um, Art and Religion in the 21st Century, Thames and Hudson, uh, 2015. Uh, and that's actually, there's going to be a new edition of that. Is that right, Aaron? Yes, if I can smuggle it in. I had the misfortune of writing a book about the 21st century before the poison of Donald Trump was elected, um, before the pandemic, um, before America finally got its act together and had a more widespread reckoning with racial injustice. So it's beginning to look, I fear, uh, just a touch dated. Tell your friends to keep buying it. But um, I think 2016 is when the world spiraled off axis. So I, I, I did convince the publisher we should probably revisit some of these things. Um, and uh, also uh, climate change. I mean, at the time, I remember having to argue to them, no, I really think we should have a chapter on, on climate change. I really don't think that would be an argument with publishers these days. Yes, well, indeed. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to, to an updated uh, uh, new edition uh, of, of that. Um, Books from Aaron always uh, something to uh, look forward to. Um, so uh, before uh, um, taking up uh, the post uh, in Washington, DC, Aaron was uh, at Rocky Mountain College in Montana. And before that, uh, at King's College London, where uh, he was a senior lecturer in sacred tradition uh, and the arts and uh, the Deputy Director of the Center for Arts and the Sacred. Um, and he has studied and taught and researched uh, at universities of Cambridge, Oxford, Yale, and Columbia, which some of you may have heard of, uh, I guess. And um, he'll be speaking to us today on um, the topic, Curating an Interfaith Pilgrimage, Visual Strategies for Interreligious Studies. Uh, the talk's going to be 45 minutes or so, something like that. It's all fairly relaxed. Uh, and then we'll uh, pause the recording and have 45 minutes or so for um, discussion. Uh, so, Aaron. All righty, Giles. Well, great to see everyone and um, especially some familiar faces, including my son eating breakfast. So that's always nice <laughs> in the distance. And um, I want to absolutely keep it pretty informal and you know if you have things that um, occur to you as questions along the way feel free to type them in the chat box type them to Giles and Giles can um, can uh, let me know he can Giles has the permission to interrupt at any time um, that he feels like it um, no soft <laughs> needed just jump in and also um, then I'd love to hear from you directly um, at the end and really um, spiral into some conversation. I think that'd be just terrific. So, because um, one of the things for us, of course, like everyone else, is when you feel sequestered in your home for um, <laughs> going on a year, it's rather nice actually to be reminded of friends around the world um, and new friends and, and welcome to students especially as well. So if you have any um, things that you want to jump in with, that's that's absolutely terrific. Um, and especially since a lot of people keep their videos off, which is fair enough, while um, while I'm talking, I'm depending on Giles as my one ambassador um, 
to determine whether I'm boring you. So you have to psychically feed all of your emotions towards Giles so that I can discern whether you're um, laughing and enjoying yourself or, um, um, uh, yeah, or, or deciding to multitask with three to four other things, which is also the curse of the internet. So what I wanna to talk to you today about is the Stations of the Cross Project. And it's a privilege to see um, among some of our guests today, uh, Aniko, who curated one of the iterations, uh, two of the iterations of this in Deventer um, and in Amsterdam, and Lika, who studied it, um, produced some great scholarship about this um, iteration in Amsterdam, and artists like Roland Biermann, and I know I'm going to miss others who have come in recently, but just to know that there'll also be an opportunity to speak to artists and other curators, and I want to foreground those voices as well when we come to uh, the conversation so you can get a richer, more textured sense, because after all, one of the exciting things about this project for me is that whilst I started it, um, it's gone off in new directions, and it's been just terrific to track that and those national contexts and religious differences have yielded actually a lot of um, data, a word I now use a lot more since I hold a Templeton grant. Um, I'm learning to try to drip in little, little bits that make me sound like a social scientist. So you'll, you'll deduce that, Giles. It's a new wrinkle in my vocabulary. So curating an interfaith pilgrimage, visual strategies for interreligious dialogue. And um, the irony here is that this makes it look very intentional, that I knew exactly what I was doing when I founded this project. Uh, and then when um, I jointly um, began it in, a, in a, a fuller sense with the Reverend Dr. Katrina Lang, um, also a Cambridge um, graduate, and we actually met in uh, biblical Hebrew a thousand years ago. <laughs> so, um, but I don't, I wouldn't claim to have known fully what I was doing or even what we were doing together um, for several years. And so there's actually a kind of forensic dimension to this that I want to kind of reconstruct how this occurred and what lessons I learned along the way. Um, and that has a practical dimension as a curator, but this reconstructive element of what was, what were we thinking? What could we have thought? Um, and how is it that we might rethink conceptions of pilgrimage and how might we nuance conceptions of interfaith dialogue and interfaith action going forward in the future. So it's like going to be a lot of looking back and sort of teasing out some of the elements that I think were late in there, but perhaps not as explicit or as intentional as they could be. And so what we found by looking at this process. So the first problem <clears throat> that we notice is when you're talking about pilgrimage, it's not actually that right. It sounds like a great thing to talk about for interreligious dialogue, but in reality, the history of pilgrimage sites is really quite dark. Um, and we can think about uh, how often pilgrimage sites have been sort of expunged or attempted to be expunged from the face of the earth by other religious groups or contesting secular ideologies. And we need to pay ample attention to that, I think, and recognize that sometimes with uh, interfaith dialogue and Giles and other peers in the Cambridge Interfaith Program will know this well, there's a tendency to have this um, kind of sunny disposition about the field and assume that, um, first of all, talking about dialogue is the same as dialogue and that dialogue is the same as action. And so there's some kind of shady syllogisms that kind of happen um, and we need to be, especially as scholars, a little bit more reticent about kind of embracing those narratives. I know teaching in a seminary now, you know, when we have, there's tours to the Holy Land and things like this. And, um, and, there's, a, and it, there's a kind of a beauty in that and something very inspiring. Um, but uh, when I think of these areas or other pilgrimage sites, I actually think it's much more of the contestation of them more than anything else. Um, so uh, I've given you just a few images on your screen here, and, and you'll be familiar, of course, um, with the, the saga at Amritsar in 1984, um, perhaps a little bit less um, familiar with the Cave of the Patriarchs um, and uh, the uh, attack on Muslim worshipers by a uh, fanatical, um, ostensibly Jewish <laughs> um, settler figure uh, in 1994. Um, and, uh, then also, of course, the, the, the um, dare I, we say, the experts in iconoclasm and misery, ISIS, um, and that the Islamic State um, wreaked havoc um, 
through so many religious sites um, for um, sacred to Islam. Um, and this is the, uh, the destruction of the tomb and the uh, mosque of Jonah. And so essentially with the logic of ISIS, it was an opportunity to strike not just at the core of um, enemies that they perceived within Islam, um, but also a history of interreligious um, uh, worship and pilgrimage as well. Um, and, and then this is not to um, give short shrift to the Yazidi sites, um, which many of which were also targeted by ISIS. So these are the kind of things that we have to have as a background as sort of primer before we get into what I want to show is a little bit more optimistic trajectory for um, ideas of interfaith pilgrimage. And um, there's, there's beginning to be some great literature, and I give a big shout out to um, our friend, uh, Dr. Lika Vinia, who's published a great book in my series um, in Bloomsbury with um, James uh, Biello. And that's about um, pilgrimage and global tourism and sort of showing different ways of activating the Bible in contemporary culture. And, um, and as Lika will know, there there's been an, this new wave of scholarship, but still a very seminal text remains, Victor and Edith Turner uh, and uh, their writings on Christian pilgrimage in particular. And, and, and so many of these insights still obtain today, but to summarize the things I've talked about so far, they write, with rare and interesting exceptions, the pilgrims of different historical religions do not visit one another's shrines. We could add when they do, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, so, where is pilgrimage um, occurring and how is it occurring uh, today? And what are some of the interreligious dimensions of that? Well, one thing to look at um, is of course the 1986 um, uh, conference in Assisi um, that was uh, initiated by Pope John Paul II. And we have um, Benedict here and, and you'll recognize some of the other figures including your own um, Lord Williams, um, but um, uh, for the 25th anniversary there. Um, but just as um, to add a little context to that, I've given you a drawing down below by uh, my friend Nicola Green. And we uh, published a, a book of her work uh, called Encounters, The Art of Interfaith Dialogue. And one of the things that um, Nicola notes, and it's cheeky, but, it's, but it has a tremendous amount of truth and, and I think reveals some intersectional challenges. She said she was, um, she was oftentimes the only woman in a room full of men in dresses. Um, and so, uh, so when, for all of the diversity we see in vestments and ethnicities and religious traditions, um, there's still a, a very clear male dominance um, and also clearly a kind of um, uh, Western hegemony there with the central framing um, of the Pope, almost like he's a little figurine in a creche there. Um, and so, which I don't think was optimal in the photographic dimensions. I think they might've rethought that one a little bit. Um, but um, so we have to think when we have inter interfaith dialogue that even if that's um, ostensibly very successful, um, and this was in this, this 2011 gathering, who is doing the gathering? Is it too top down? And that's been a, uh, a major problem for interfaith dialogue. Ibu Patel um, has written um, uh, interestingly for and excessively um, about this topic. And also does it take account of gender and what kind what happens when you collapse um, uh, diversity within a given uh, denomination into a singular figure. And um, Rowan Williams has, has uh, written very eloquently about this, including in that forward to the book Nickel and I did about what those dynamics are. Um, so imagine um, the opposite of Donald Trump thinking about the presidency. <laughs> so so what, 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 it, what, it, what does it mean to embody and inhabit these um, traditions and to assume the, the sort of physical mantle of this kind of active representation? Um, and we also see um, uh, Brianna Taylor here who was murdered by police in some of the, uh, one of uh, sadly numerous examples of um, essentially state murder of, of black people by um, American um, police and security forces. Um, this is a projection uh, that was done on the Robert E. Lee Memorial. Um, for those who are Americans, it won't surprise you. And 
Uh, for those of you who are not, you've probably been still following this fairly closely um, because it's had ripples around Europe in particular. Um, but uh, it's truly shocking to the degree of Confederate monuments around the states. And as Giles noted, I did have a rustication in Montana for a couple of years for a professorship. Um, and, uh, and Montana has a Confederate monument. You might think, why would Montana, which did not exist, have a Confederate monument, and it's because the Confederate soldiers looked to, um, as they um, as they fled, they looked to go to far flung areas and replicate the um, the dying gas of the ideology that had just been defeated. And so, um, so this is a very prominent representation of that, that that this could exist in Richmond, Virginia. It's now since been taken down. Um, but a really um, powerful sense of how people have come together and formed a pilgrimage site spontaneously with things that really resemble ex votos. And now with the tools of scholars like David Morgan and uh, Brent Plate, we're beginning to have a more, I think, robust methodology for understanding what's happening at these kinds of sites. And so one of the things that I've wanted to do with Stations of the Cross is to be thinking about how it is that we, uh, we provide opportunities for impromptu experiences, um, but we are also not too heavy handed. We, um, and, uh, and that we, we are adaptive and we also learn from the way pilgrimage itself is being reshaped along the way. And uh, speaking of the way, here's the uh, Martin Sheen, a little um, uh, West Wing hero for Giles here, um, and an acceptably decent movie. Um, and, uh, and this shows the popularization of um, El Camino and the way in which uh, pilgrimage is now so much shaped by media experience. And that mediation, as it were, um, is also tackled in Lika's book, a very interesting um, essay by one of her co uh, colleagues, Suzanne, I think it is, um, who's looking at the way in which watching movies about uh, the Camino and reading books about it shapes how it is that people experience it in very direct ways, that they want to go to look at something because it was in the movie. And it's too easy to dismiss those kind of th engagements as um, fake or shallow. And we need to see how it is that that might be a portal to, to other modes of experience. Now, I want to uh, address a question that I think uh, is in the heart of my grandmother, um, which is how does a good Jewish boy get interested in Jesus? Um, and the, one of the, the dangerous gateway drug there is um, Cambridge and studying in a divinity faculty. I often say I was, I'm Jewish, but I felt more trained as a Christian theologian, which I, I believe was genuinely a very good thing. Uh, and I ended up writing a very peculiar kind of very autodidactic uh, um, PhD thesis, which became a book. And Giles had the misfortune of reading that um, early on. One, and I remember talking memorably at the University Library um, uh, Cafe about that, which um, shows the importance to um, in an age of Corona of um, bad food, bad tea, bad coffee to intellectual discourse. Um, and uh, one of the questions that was really animating that early project of mine, which I would eventually really come back to in stations was, how can we find Jewishness where it's unlikely or perhaps where it doesn't even exist? Um, I really wanted explicitly, whilst there are good books on this by Richard Cohen and others, to look for Judaism with, not in pictures of rabbis, not in things which are um, clear Jewish symbols. Now, this one is a bit more acute because it's, of course, painted um, in the early years of the Holocaust, um, and it has a, um, a very polemical sting to it. Um, but I really wanted in that project to dig further into why does an artist like Chagall keep painting crucifixions um, throughout the rest of his life? What does it symbolize? And you find different ways Jewish artists have have uh, triangulated their way into that um, religious iconography in those themes in a way that doesn't um, show an abandonment of Judaism, but rather a very deep engagement and a very interesting one with right for following by other artists. So that was a project that began um, uh, under the uh, tutelage of Graham House and uh, who passed away recently. And I wanted to remember Graham in this, um, this little presentation who was one of the um, cutest, most avuncular, but also sharpest tongued, um, fantastic individuals. And I loved him very dearly. Um, he was so supportive of me in, in every way. Um, and, uh, and 
<laughs> uh, Giles can send to those of you who haven't seen it yet, uh, just a piece that I wrote about him. And there's also the, um, a, a nice series of tributes in art and Christianity that's um, coming out as well. Um, but uh, Graham, re Graham really uh, shimmers through a lot of the work that I continue to do, especially that engage that sense of building networks and bridges with interesting people, because above all, Graham was a collector of people. Um, and, and a project like this is kind of a testimony to thinking about what um, uh, public scholarship looks like. Now, what are the traditions of the Stations of the Cross? As many of you will know, it's actually um, quite a jumble. Uh, like all traditions, we, I always joke about this with my wife, uh, the Reverend Doctor, and, uh, Doctor uh, Carolyn Rosen, that um, uh, on this on the call, and our son Arthur, is that uh, you know with churches everything becomes tradition. And so as soon as someone wants to, I remember I would have the perversity of going. I used to teach in the church where Carolyn was rector um, when I was in Montana. And I would move the books that I didn't like from the church library and the church librarian, the designated library fellow, let's say, um, she uh, she would say, oh, I think this is a good sign. People are reading these books. And then she, so but then she would uh, replace them back on her own highly intricate system of cataloging um, and including counting every day the um, the 1980s cassette tapes by a former priest, which I believe no one listened to in the 80s and certainly still have not been listened to. Um, so uh, and so everything in a church environment can become tradition and it can calcify so quickly. It's like um, a chemistry exper experiment for making stalactites, right? <laughs> like you, it has all the conditions ready to, to, to conjure tradition almost instantly. So if you change something like in my seminary environment changing where a painting hangs, immediately someone will say it's always been there and you have to remind them, no, I have a picture of it from a year ago. It was not there, trust me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the Stations of the Cross feel very calcified now at 14, but we have to remember, of course, that the, uh, the state, the following the footsteps of Jesus was actually done oftentimes uh, in reverse, um, beginning with Golgotha, so uh, time traveling, as it were, um, and that the actual sites are, of course, hugely disputed um, denominationally, um, and the kind of internecine um, squabbles that go on in the Holy Sepulcher, and as many of you will know, of course, the keys being held by a Muslim for good reason um, with squabbling Christians. Um, and, uh, and it's really not till 1731, I think it is, that it's really codified by the Catholic Church and the Franciscans are given a special dispensation to, um, to set up stations. Um, and, it, and it's really then takes a long time for stations to be something that churches simply um, erect by themselves. And, uh, and then there's many uh, ecumenical permutations on this. One popular Protestant one is doing eight stations and even further Catholic innovations like in the early 1990s with um, Pope John Paul II doing a scriptural way of the cross um, and acknowledging that as you see here, these are not um, necessarily scriptural um, uh, events. Some of them are, some of them are attested in the gospels, um, but some of them are not. And some of them are embellished in very unique and interesting ways. And one of the things that I wanted to do in the project, and I think kind of innocently, was that at the start, I thought, well, I really want to go with the serious version, right? Which is always the way someone approaches someone else's religion, is this assumption about what is, um, what is doctrine and, what it, and a certain inflexibility and searching for the real thing. And so even when one's trained against that, there's still this kind of 19th century um, uh, lens that one can find oneself putting on inadvertently of, of sort of textualizing others' religions um, and assuming that what is what is inscribed is the true reality as opposed to the the on the ground permutations, which are oftentimes richer and more exciting. Um, and I put here just one. Uh, image by my friend Lenny Dothan. Um, this is a still from a video in which she walks um, through the old city along the Via Dolorosa and all you see is her feet marching and, and it was displayed in a video um, above, uh, above a pulpit in, at a UCC church um, in central DC. And so it had the sense of kind of an, a perpetual ascension that's happening. Um, it's a very beautiful work. Um, but what you don't see there is that um, that, and I saw the raw footage before, is that as she's taking the camera and following herself, 
um, people are shouting at her in Hebrew saying, you crazy woman, what are you doing? Like, don't you know there's needles, there's trash there, you're gonna hurt your feet. Like, are you crazy? Do you need help? All of these different things. And so there's a tendency also to distill pilgrimage into sort of iconic images and to, um, and to construct a type of purity there, um, which doesn't exist. And, and probably for good reason, actually. And so we'll dig into that a little bit, um, a little bit further. So I found myself thinking about these questions, particularly because I was teaching a, a course about uh, uh, the lives of London at KCL at the time to undergraduates, which I loved. And we would go around to different sites. We had the privilege to go into the temple a number of times um, to, uh, at, uh, at the invitation of um, uh, the master, um, Robin Griffith Jones. And, uh, and I wanted to, I began to, be very interested in the way in which Jerusalem is consistently rebuilt. Basically, every major Christian city in the world has seen itself as a new Jerusalem, and every sort of proto-nation state has seen itself as a new Israel, or every sort of breakaway people, right? So it's not surprising that um, the, the Welsh have had, uh, have, have produced maps that, um, Martin O'Kane, I remember memorably presented that overlay um, the 12 tribes into Wales and that Mormons have done the same thing with the, the, um, the tribes of Israel um, in Utah, right? So that there's different ways in which you begin to perceive um, this uh, intentional sort of um, palimpsest um, that develops. And, uh, and one of the things that's of course very interesting is that these uh, evocations of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in the round were being produced all over London. There's several examples that Catherine Hundley has, um, has researched, including one that um, was discovered at the, the base of a pret, um, which is a kind of um, ignominy that um, we come to find in uh, contemporary uh, archaeology. Um, and uh, Maybe, maybe one day it'll go. Yeah, I don't know. The, it's very strange to think about mass being performed where, you know, now people are having, uh, you know, tuna sandwiches on their work breaks um, from print. So um, there, this act though of imagining oneself and one's place as Jerusalem, and I might also think about the Round Church in Cambridge for those of you who are thinking in that direction, is um, that, uh, yeah, that it, it's so uh, it's so sort of expansive, and it intersects with a number of other um, contemporary ideas about pilgrimage. And we oftentimes forget that it's not just about sort of reincarnating or transporting Jerusalem, um, and, and which is really what's kind of happening imaginatively in, in um, something like the temple, but also desires to found pilgrimages like the. Um, the relic of the holy blood um, that Emily Gary has researched very well, the kind of failed pilgrim, medieval um, British pilgrimage to try to say, look, we, uh, you know, who would believe it? But we found some real blood. Um, this, sorry, it's hard for me not to adapt, adapt the kind of Jewish uh, sort of inflection to this. But, um, but I love these things when you just sort of find these relics and like, I mean, you know, there was plenty on eBay, but we got the real one. Uh, let me tell you, this one's totally, legit it's certificate of authenticity and everything and so um uh and it was a, gr a wonderful example because it was um also involved some really complex theology which they never really co um, convinced people of that um was jesus fully resurrected with all his blood was it as it were sort of reabsorbed into his body what does resurrection mean do you gather in all of the damaged parts you have like a you know uh like you know terminator 2 right is it that is there all there all of the elements sort of return to you so this had to be this was deemed to be non-essential blood so it was okay so it was both really important but not so important that jesus needed upon resurrection so there's all of these wonderful wrinkles that you get in, as you begin to try to assert new pilgrimages and so whilst that was a failure i thought well that's an interesting template um, and so i wanted to to sort of evoke um, elements of these, um, these different uh, successful pilgrimages, failed pilgrimages, and really think of London as, again, palimpsestically, that there is a, that there's all of these overlaid strata and there are um, records of sacred journeys crisscrossing London in all of these different directions. And now wonderfully and spectacularly, and of course, in many different faith traditions as well. And how is it that we can sort of pick up these, not to say we do that 
in that in this project perfectly. There's so many practical considerations, but I think the ambition to do so is is quite an interesting one. And and by the way, here's another piece by Lenny in um, in Temple um, that uh, and you can see this is actually just a sculpture of a person, um, and it's meant to evoke the effigies there. And um, and what happened was that people. Um, uh, some people complained. They thought it was a real a homeless person um, sleeping rough inside the temple. And it was interesting to see how this kind of decorum with, with which they negotiate their way around these effigies, which are really part of a kind of somewhat crazy um, uh, medieval legend about mythic foundations of, of England. <laughs> um, they're not really quite as um, illustrious as one might think in some sense. Um, and, uh, and yet when they encounter an actual, what they perceive to be a body, how distressing they find that. Um, and so you had people reporting that to various people and being upset at the temple, but you also had people tucking um, 20 quid notes um, under the um, backpack for the, the, what they believed was the person that was sleeping there. Um, so again, a, a way in which um, uh, the kind of serendipity might, might uh, uh, factor into pilgrimages. Now, um, in the projects, one of the, the main concerns we've had is where do you, um, how do you activate spaces that um, aren't necessarily um, seen in a religious context and why might you do so? And one of the main problems uh, is that that, it, that has really um, pushed people to go looking for religion and art. And I've, uh, I've highlighted looking here because I'm going to focus on looking and walking as two elements as we begin to move towards the sort of last third of this little presentation is that um, people don't spend that long looking at art. And so there's a kind of jealousy um, that curators often have of what, how it is that people look at art in churches, how fantastically moved they might be. And how is it that they might summon some of that? So there's both a, um, an economic and a kind of intellectual underpinning to why they might go looking to adapt uh, religious conventions or emulate things. Um, and uh, and so then you have you know, different approaches to, to doing this. And um, I think the, the strongest one here, it, this intuition is from uh, Neil McGregor, uh, that modern secular audiences can engage with masterpieces of Christian art at an emotional as well as purely aesthetic or historical level. And this is from the foundational show of Seeing Salvation, um, which I was fortunate to see in 2000. That was my first um, year in Cambridge, 1999, 2000. So uh, the millennium was a pretty epochal time, actually. Um, and um, who, would have, who would have imagined what would happen in, in Britain and the world at that point? Um, one of the questions that I think is nicely asked in Roland's new piece for the iteration of stations this year. So um, what we see there is... <laughs> What we see here is one of the very interesting um, uh, plays of language that at an emotional as well as aesthetic or historical level, right? So pay attention to that. So there, this is actually quite a groundbreaking show, um, but there's still a desire not to say religious or, or even spiritual, which are deployed in various particular contexts, but to say emotional. And that becomes a kind of a code word that's, that's pretty dense and encompassing to allow um, to, to, to allow that pivot to say, here's why we should be doing this in a national museum and why you shouldn't be afraid of it, right? So this is sort of, this is already a very brave and important leap, I think, in museology, but one that has a certain tentativity, um, a tentative nature sort of built into that vocabulary. And then um, as a less um, uh, intellectually robust example, we can have um, uh, Alan de Botton, I know it's perhaps a little bit of an easy target here, um, so I apologize, but, um, uh, or to fans as possible, um, that um, uh, he uh, rightly posited, um, to give him some credit here, that, um, that museums can do more to be, and you know, he recycles this idea about, you know, museums becoming cathedrals and the new churches, yada, yada. I mean, anyone who's worked in this area have seen this so often that it's, a, um, it, it's just a kind of vague paraphrase of Malraux, basically. Um, but the, um, but, so his idea, his big idea of delivering on this though, um, uh, I think showcases the problems of kind of cheap answers. Um, to use kind of slightly Bonhoeffer language, is that he um, 
uh, he posits that art is therapy, right? So he uses this new age um, psychological, uh, popular psychological sort of language, art is therapy. And his big, his big take home is that he should put um, uh, post-it notes, giant post-it notes all around the Rijksmuseum, which has some of the greatest religious masterpieces in the entire history of Christendom. And he should do those um, by, uh, by offering his little remarks, he and his, um, his partner, um, John Armstrong, um, giving sort of anodyne remarks about why it is that one should look at this portrait. You might not think this Rembrandt's interesting, but it actually is, and it's applicable to your experience watching TV or whatever. Um, so um, one second, I just can hear just a tiny bit of feedback. I um, uh, just wanna fix that, okay. Um, so one of the things that we see here is then um, with Alan de Botton um, is that we, he's missing an opportunity to look at what's actually right in front of his face, which is that if we want to do, if we want to get people to look religiously, why don't we give them religious things to look at? And why don't we, and why don't we try to look at them religiously? It doesn't mean we have to do so in a way that is fully um, doctrinaire that we have, to, um, we have to assume that um, there's a monoglot and monocultural dimension to all of the lookers, but that there can be, that we can introduce people to religious modalities of looking that are keyed into the way some of these works um, were looked at in their quote unquote original context. And in doing so, we might re-inhabit those in interesting and in, in even quite playful ways. Um, and I think a very strong example of this is the, the number of series that Neil McGregor does. And so McGregor has a, um, uh, a series of works that he does in the uh, National Gallery. And actually, I just want to pause for one second, Joshua. I just have a little bit of feedback. One second. Okay, I think, I think we've possibly solved this. It could be on our end that we're hearing um, an echo of um, my son watching the presentation upstairs. Um, so Giles, you can text Carolyn and tell her to turn that down. <laughs> sure, we, we can't hear it on this end, so. Okay, well, that's good. It just reminds me of a BBC interview I had where I could listen to myself doing feedback the entire time and I had to move the earphones back and forth, right? Um, so uh, with the... Um, with the Haas show, that's the culmination of a series that he does after moving from uh, the National Gallery to the British Museum. And he does um, a show on uh, papyrology, he does a, a Egyptian religion, um, and then he moves to uh, Viking examples and then the Hajj in contemporary context. And it's a fantastic show. Um, and I think it's around 2012. And this is um, uh, curated by Venetia Porter. Um, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this is that you see an immediate shift in museum demographics. So 47%, I um, count Rosie Parker's a really interesting source on this, that 47% um, of the viewers of the Haas show were Muslim. And that compares to 3% of viewers um, generally for their other shows um, before that that year. So you see a fantastic um, shift um, for the Hajj. And what's very interesting is that, um, that this opens really great opportunities for interfaith dialogue because they're, um, because uh, Non-Muslim viewers can see Muslims interacting with their own heritage through this kind of double watching of looking, um, looking at the exhibition context, but also being surrounded by people who are looking at it in a different register, looking at it oftentimes um, for an applicability to their religious sense of self. Um, and for Muslim viewers, an opportunity to also see their tradition being engaged with respectfully um, by viewers. And also, so there's, um, so there's a lot of looking um, mutually that's going on at the same time as looking at um, the objects that are in front of them. And so uh, the real take home from this Neil McGregor and Venus Reporter uh, exhibition is that, um, again, we need to open opportunities for people to do religious things. And, uh, and in doing so, it doesn't foreclose opportunities for rich interfaith dialogue. It actually opens them by doing them in an honest, transparent fashion in one tradition, um, as he'd done with Seeing Salvation, and then again, another register with the Hajj to show um, that 
an engagement with one tradition allows potentially for other traditions to draw interesting parallels and to apply these and to sort of reconceive of their relationship with the arts. And so this has a great, uh, these shows represent a great and changing context. But one of the things is that, you know, a great museum show has an opportunity to change things for a time, but doesn't necessarily change all of the things, the internal dynamics of museums. And we see this abiding trend um, to sort of recursively go back to either this model of um, an educational museum or an aesthetic one, to use this terminology of uh, Carol Duncan in Civilizing Rituals. And so either you have this kind of enlightenment model that we're building up citizenry for and, and sort of supporting national mythologies and narratives um, by educating people about the past of their, um, of their country, especially this was important in France. Um, and then the Brits sort of glommed on to this. Basically, there had to be a lot of convincing to, that um, the public needed art, um, but it was really competing with France that helped spur the um, foundation of the Na British Museum and National Gallery in, um, in England. But, uh, and then in the aesthetic model that there'd be something rapturous and individual and this kind of romantic um, sublime that's encountered. But one of the interesting things is where does religion fit within that. Uh, so in the, in the educational historical model, it's religion is something that you can learn about, but there's almost in some ways transcended and we're, we're only studying um, desiccated practices of the past. Um, whereas in the uh, example of, of the, uh, the, this more romantic, sublime or aesthetic encounter, religion might be there, but it's only in terms of this, this spirituality, this kind of ecstatic individual experience. So there's very little room for the communal. And so there's a lot of, so the, the, um, the long and the short of it is that there's so much discursive work that kind of needs to be done in order to make room for religion in museums and the kind of ways we're talking about with Stations of the Cross. Um, and some of that comes out of it, you know, an earnest desire to be, multicultural, multi-religious, and, and this kind of anxiety that they're not, they're betraying their core missions if they show things too religiously. And that was dramatized in stations by using this uh, Jacopo uh, Bassano uh, way to Calvary as one of our stations in the National Gallery. And actually um, there was, you know, some uh, interesting, very legitimate questions about whether they should be involved with this new project. Um, so we had to remind them that it's really inspired by the Neil McGregor show of seeing, seeing Salvation. That's what sort of is the conceptual underpinning. And so they're already doing this um, and this fits within that. Um, but it's interesting how even institutions which have embraced that in individual um, exhibition contexts, um, th that they might still um, call back to these sort of uh, museological traditions that are so sort of strong from the from the past. Um, and then with Barnett Newman at the National Gallery um, uh, of Art in Washington, DC, um, I remember approaching people and they said, sure, we'd love people to come to this and to see, see these works and to approach them with this context. Um, but, and even though I said, well, I'm Jewish, I've written on Barnett Newman, we're not trying to Christianize him, all these different things, there was still this tremendous anxiety about that. And they said, why don't we kind of do it on the down low? Why don't we, we'd love to have people come, but we do not want to have explicit um, signage like we did in the National Gallery in London. And so I think it shows that the, the way national context can really inflect ideas of what makes for productive or possible into religious dialogue. So, now I want to move sort of quickly on, and we're just going to come to the last sort of um, few slides. Josh, maybe another 10 minutes. Does that sound good? Okay. So um, one of the things then is to also acknowledge that people are um, beginning to look at art very religiously, but we still haven't always taken seriously what's happening there. And so um, oftentimes there's this desire to simply utilize the vocabulary that people are um, articulating at first and saying, well, there's a spiritual experience that I had at the Rothko Chapel, for instance. Um, but actually, um, as uh, I've written about, but a number of um, very interesting scholars of new book coming out on this with Breffels, is that um, there, the Rothko Chapel works partly because of the way in which Rothko wanted religious associations to school the fingertips, to use a sort of George Steiner phrase, of how it is 
um, that people engaged with the arts. He wanted these to be triptychs. He wanted you to approach them with the same kind of devotional reverence. And it's that approach which also dictates what people pull out of um, these experiences. They don't just come unformed from the womb to the Rothko Chapel and have an ecstatic religious experience. They come looking for something and they, and they experience it through a lot of tactical devices, however subtle and minimalist they might seem to be um, from the artist. And, and I've given you just some other examples in Texas, which has become oddly a mecca for um, uh, religion, for art, um, uh, especially land art and environmental art and things with, um, with strong religious uh, connotations to them. And I really see Ellsworth uh, Kelly's work, particularly in that context. And so people are already doing religious things, um, but we haven't in all cases evolved the vocabulary to talk in more nuanced ways about what's happening there. So the last section I wanna call attention to this uh, dynamic of walking. What is it that, uh, you know, very obvious thing, but one of the things that's important about a pilgrimage and where some of the most important interreligious material and, and encounters happen is in these, um, uh, these in-between spaces. And that's something that's witnessed so well in the Victor and Edith Turner reflections. And of course, they're going right back to the Canterbury Tales, right? This is not new that um, it's on the way to the pub or in the pub that the great religious work and the dialogue and the community formation is really occurring. And so we wanted to try to conjure opportunities for that to happen and create um, uh, routes that felt logical. But you can see some, um, some geographies have their sort of um, their urban uh, development histories um, replicate these things and create opportunities as we see of traveling down the spine of New York, um, whereas London is explicitly, especially in its, its development as sort of an east-west um, uh, space. And so, um, so part of it is then in the more sort of central radiating features of, of Dutch cities um, and canal structures. So, um, the, uh, so it's sort of adapting to those geographies, but creating opportunities for people to have, for the things that they look at on the way, incidentally, to inflect the kind of experiences that they're having. And of course, in ternarian terms, this means that you are providing liminal spaces and it's, there's a dehierarchization, and that's what, um, what allows for this unique amount of, of, of communitas, which his sort of Latin, um, uh, terminology that he, for which he means this kind of uh, something that may sort of calcify back into hierarchy, but for, for a limited moment in these liminal spaces is something that draws people together in perhaps unlikely sort of uh, latitudinarian relationships. Um, so some of the things that we began to notice, and this is, I actually I must say that this was, um, I wouldn't have probably kept data on this if it was not for the ref um, at King. So this is probably the only recorded time in history of the ref helping scholarship. Um, and so uh, I was able to uh, get surveys from people as they, um, uh, online as they were accessing our uh, materials and our podcast or app and things like this. And these are just a few of the um, quotations that um, people had, but I think really interesting, very frankly, quite um, poetic in several cases. And you can see here then uh, a pilgrimage that we were um, uh, undertaking um, with the Bishop of London, um, Richard and uh, Cardinal Vincent, um, uh, who was the Archbishop of Westminster Cathedral. And some of the stops that we made, including at um, Gularatis's uh, fantastic piece at, um, at Salvation Army headquarters and in front of Roland uh, Bierman's work here, his stations um, where, which sort of, especially in this image really gives you a sense of it as almost like this Western wall. Um, and this is serendipitous shot of the crossing point, right? So we, um, we found that people were having experiences that were really deepened by the textures of how they got to spaces and what, and the way the experience of looking at that art carried with them as they went to the next spot. Um, and some of these unexpected things happened with a fantastic job that the curators, including Aniko and Marlene did in, uh, in Amsterdam is taking spaces that would otherwise be fairly neglected that in the, um, uh, in the red light district that there is the chapel of, uh, the Everyman's Chapel of, um, of St. George, which, um, it specifically is open 24 hours to minister to the needs of sex workers and people that um, are sort of caught in this, um, this throng. And so it provides a moment of relief and quiet. And I already mentioned the um, piece here by Lenny Dothan, 
But one of the things we really want to do is have artworks which not only explicitly declare themselves as art, but also at times um, either seem to be part of the liturgical framework or part of just human inhabitation. And so you have a sense of stumbling upon things and having to work your way through that material, which I think is very important to the experience of pilgrimage. Um, and here's a work by Michael Takeo Magruder, another uh, frequent collaborator of mine. And it's a little hard to see, but it's, it's almost impossible to perceive without seeing it in person anyways, um, which is a Shroud of Turin that's electronically generated. And then you have the faces of uh, refugees from the Syrian um, crisis that sort of um, sort of float to the surface. And so there's a kind of undulation of this fabric that it becomes formed by the faces as well as the engraved names of victims. Um, and, uh, and one of the things, uh, we've installed this in a number of locations. Um, and it was recently um, dedicated in the presence of um, uh, Syrian refugees in uh, Detroit in a church at Christbrook, um, Cranbrook. But, this is at the Church of the Epiphany where Katrina Lang was a priest at the time. And one of the fantastically interesting dynamics is that it's, you know, it's very close to the White House. And so we were doing this at a time of the um, uh, Trump's major border wall inane push there. Um, but also that um, that it is it's a, a, it's known as a refuge for the homeless population that um, that are um, that are so afflicted in that central part of DC, and so there was really practical questions of do you lock this kind of very valuable technique uh, very technology that um, uh, contained in here are these flat screen. Um, uh, uh, televisions, all the um, compu uh, uh, computer that Michael built himself, all these different elements. And the decision was really made to not overly protect these things because it is in a church and it should be permeable. It should not be something, especially the optics of fencing off the altar was not something we really wanted to have. And so um, to make it as accessible um, for as much of the day as possible, but at an interreligious dynamic was added when um, we were, uh, we're setting up one day and no one had really told me um, about the schedule and how the church is used. And there's a major um, Islamic cultural center that needs overspill spaces for city workers who need to be praying at midday. And so there was actually Juma occurring um, and everyone bringing in um, their prayer rugs and everything um, as we were fine tuning some of the computing um, technology for the piece. And it was a fantastic opportunity to have a dialogue about what we were trying to do with this and to really test um, work that's responsive to um, a major catastrophe that was unfolding in the, in the Muslim world. And, and Michael was very interested to see how people would react to it and especially using the Christian framing um, imagery of the Shroud of Turin. And so it was a very rich dialogue. And I think it shows also how you can't always plan all of these dimensions. You have to pick spaces and then be aware of and responsive to the interreligious or intercultural um, or socioeconomic differences that might obtain there. And so finally, to come to the end here, um, I found for myself that it was not just the walking um, walking to see art but walking with art that was very transformational and um, and this is the piece by um, Gularatis um, that I, I mentioned before that there was that stop in our pilgrimage journey we did in London this what happened before it gets hung up as a tapestry um, is that when it was all sewed from these clothes that were donated um, and and many of the clothes then were um, then uh, uh, sent to uh, refugees, particularly in um, Greece and Turkey. Um, and it was sewed by, um, uh, largely by women who were part of uh, refugee networks that the artist was in touch with, um, especially from Turkey. And uh, we had a procession with this piece um, where she had a performance artist who's actually had to be quite strong to um, sustain this, that she is walking underneath that, that mounded figure like a, like a very sort of grim bridal train. And everyone else was needed to sort of hold up and support this piece um, as she was walking. And we walked from, um, uh, as you come out of the uh, Salvation Army International Headquarters, you are caught between St. Paul's on the one hand and Tate Modern on the other, and you're crossing Millennium Bridge, right? So it cannot be <laughs> better symbolically as this embodiment of the way in which 
you are traversing the distance between religion and art. You're actually physically sort of um, doing that in this kind of pilgrimage journey that you're undertaking. And this piece began to undulate and, and, um, and um, quite wildly in a way, actually. It sort of begun, begins very slowly, but then it becomes almost more, more jagged and in this kind of mathematical response to the wind. And you had pieces of clothing whipping their way off and flying into the, um, the Thames below. And it was this real evocation of the, the danger and uncertainty of what a sea voyage is. And so the piece really began to take on a life of its own through this act of walking, um, carrying these messages, which could not be um, more personal, but also more related to the Pieta. Why did my son have to die? As one of the um, women wrote in um, in Sharpie on this, this little basic white onesie. And so we found ultimately that it's in uh, creating these opportunities for walking that you experience not only the new power of the art, but also power of other people doing it with you. And so it's not just that we were gathering together as this group on um, the people that had sewed it and, and students of mine and others who had assisted, but you had people that would stop and they would help. Yet of course you had people blow on by or people that were annoyed or whatever, or people that simply took photos, but people said, do you want help? It was amazing to me because they have no idea what they're what we're doing, why we're doing it, and it's a piece of art and it's ostensibly purposeless. We're marching to Tate Modern and back, but they wanted to help. They felt that there was something they could perceive something ritually interesting happening by ritual and art um, taking um, uh, a, a very public space and being open to the dimensions of that type of engagement. And so ultimately, it was, a very, it was a moment, one of the rare moments in my life where my sort of cynicism melted away slightly. And I could see myself really not just as a curator, or as a scholar is what's happening, uh, but really almost this dimension of a, of a pilgrim's experience. And so the ultimate um, lesson for me coming out of this work of art, but also the project at large, was that medieval pilgrimages, as David Friedberg memorably says, um, are, are built on hope. You go on pilgrimage to be cured for, um, for um, uh, conditions afflicting your family to end, economic conditions, all these different things, but you, you, it's the hope that animates you. But um, one of the things that I would submit, especially as a lesson for interreligious dialogue and the arts that we've experienced through stations, is that that hope is really the outcome. That, that that's, you might not be able to, something I think Graham Howes would appreciate as an insight, is that, um, we may not be in a position to begin with that hope for a certain type of deliverance, a certain type of miraculous outcome, but we can do pilgrimage and begin with the doing and the hoping can come afterwards. The hoping can be the thing that's produced in that rich amalgam of public experience together of something sacred. So there we go. Thank you very much. And I'd love to take questions and I probably went on maybe just a touch too long, but um, excited, much more excited to hear from you guys. No, thank you, Aaron. That was perfect. Um, not a not a moment uh, too long. Um, wonderful, um, invigorating, uh, moving presentation. Um, so yes, uh, if you if you have a question, um, there are.